Hello, I'm Professor Bridget Byrne, Director of Code, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second session of this week's conference organised with the Stuart Hall Foundation, Racial Inequality in Times of Crisis. While COVID-19 hi highlighted and exacerbated long-standing racial and ethnic inequalities in the UK across a range of social arenas, the ensuing crisis in living standards and the criminalising of protests could further entrench these inequalities. As the pandemic wanes, we'd thrust deeper into a confluence of crises. Governmental inertia in response to the cost of living crisis and climate change, and a coordinated attack on civil right to protest by the state's policing, crime, sentencing and courts bill. While COVID-19 threw existing inequalities into sharp relief, these crises continue to disproportionately impact the lives of society's most vulnerable people. Racial inequality in times of crisis is a week long online conference exploring the impact of present day crises on racially minoritized people and communities in the UK. The event is hosted through a partnership between the Stuart Hall Foundation and the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity Code. We've invited researchers and practitioners working across the fields of sociology, history, art, media, activism, politics and healthcare to take part in a series of online presentations and discussions that focus on a number of areas impacted by COVID-19 and ensuing crises. Education and policing was yesterday, but a recording will still be will soon be available on our websites. Activism, housing and healthcare are the themes. CODE, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, just to tell you a little bit about us, is a research centre based at the University of Manchester, but bringing together colleagues from six universities across the UK. Our current research programme looks at COVID, race and ethnic inequalities and seeks to provide a rapid response to the crisis posed by COVID-19 and its social, cultural and economic impact on racially minoritised groups. We're a multidisciplinary team using a range of different methods and seeking to provide robust evidence on the often lethal impact of racial and ethnic discrimination and inequality. We aim to provide new data in accessible formats to champion policy and institutional change by showing where and how racial inequality is present, how it builds on and extends existing pat patterns of inequality and how this is experienced in everyday lives. We're very clear that the impact racial and ethnic, of racial and ethnic discrimination and disadvantage are not one-off events, but processes that happen across the life course and across all aspects of the lives of individuals and communities. We want to understand those processes, but also working with a range of partners, we want to think about how communities are challenging discrimination and disadvantage, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter. The Stuart Hall Foundation was established in 2015 by Professor Stuart Hall's family, friends and colleagues. The foundation is committed to public education, addressing urgent questions of race and inequality in culture and society through talks and events and building a growing network of Stuart Hall Foundation scholars and artists and residents. We work collaborat they work collaboratively to for forge creative partnerships in the spirit of Stuart Hall, thinking together and working towards a racially just and more equal future. So I'm very pleased to have this partnership with the Stuart Hall Foundation. We take on Stuart Hall's call for the aim of academic research on race and racism to be to change the world by challenging racial injustice and discrimination. And for that reason, I'm also very pleased that today's panel is going to discuss the challenges of activism, especially around questions of sexuality and identity. I'm now going to hand over to Ruth ramsden Karelse, who will introduce and chair the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Ruth ramsden Karelse, and I'm really happy to be chairing this panel on activism and also to be able to introduce our three speakers this evening. Um, so before we get started, I just want to also mention that I have Tourette's syndrome, which can present as physical and vocal nonverbal tics. Um, so if I do start coughing or sniffing, for example, at any point during the event this evening, that is why. Uh, so now I'm going to welcome our panelists. Omi Dale is the press officer at UK Black Pride, which is the world's largest celebration for African, Asian, Middle Eastern, Latin American and Caribbean heritage LGBTQI plus people. 
UK Black Pride's current work involves distributing funding to organisations supporting LGBTQI plus Black people and people of colour across the UK as a direct response to their inaugural community survey, We Will Be Heard. Omi also works in the sports sector and looks at the participation rates and barriers faced by the LGBT plus community and people of colour as director of the community interest company Swim Unity and working with organisations such as Pride in Water and Freestyle Friday. Hi Omi. Um, and we're then going to hear from Saskia Papadakis, who has been an organiser with Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrants since 2018. Saskia is currently working at the University of Manchester, where she's researching histories of British black power in Leicester. Uh, hi, Saskia. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Jason Okandaye, who was born to British Nigerian parents in South London in 1997. Jason writes essays, features, and profiles on politics and culture for publications such as The Guardian, The London Review of Books, British Vogue, GQ, Ice, Dazed, and ID. Jason also co-curates the digital archive Black and Gay Back in the Day, documenting Black LGBT life in Britain since the 1970s. Jason holds a first-class degree in human, social, and political science from Pembroke College at the University of Cambridge. And his first book, called Revolutionary Acts will be a social history of black gay men in Britain and will be published by Faber in spring 2024. Hi Jason. So Omi, Saskia and Jason are going to speak for about 10 minutes each in that order and we'll then have a conversation for about 35 minutes during which I'll be able to ask some questions and then for the last um, 15 minutes or so we'll open up the discussion and pose questions from those of you joining us at home. So please do feel welcome to start sending in your questions anytime from now using the Q&A function um, which is a button labelled Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to you Omi. Thank you um, so much, Ruth, for that introduction. So yeah, um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Omi Dell and I'm speaking on behalf of UK Black Pride where I'm the press officer. Um, so yeah, for a bit of background, um, UK Black Pride started about 16 years ago um, with a bus full of um, black lesbians going to South End on Sea. And it really came out of the idea um, and the want for a space for people of color um, from the LGBTQI plus community. Um, which doesn't re didn't really exist, um, still in many spaces doesn't exist, um, but it's now become the world's largest yeah, celebration for African, Asian, Middle Eastern, Latin American and Caribbean heritage people. So yeah, whilst um, our organisation mainly focuses on our annual celebration, um, which we had in Stratford this year with 25,000 people, um, a lot of the work we do is about trying to represent the communities that come under our umbrella as far as we can. Um, a lot of our work, we try to you know, live by the motto for us and by us. So that's not only in the makeup of our team, but also in the work that we do. And naturally, given the communities that come under our umbrella, we can't ignore like the political climate that we exist in. Um, you know, just some things that in the past few years, you know, transphobic and homophobic hate crimes have been on the increase unfortunately but this comes with you know a, a justified mistrust with the police um, and the justice system we have a cabinet at the minute where many members um, have openly been transphobic we have the police crime sentencing and courts act which um, for many people in, in many of the communities that we try to represent um, people don't necessarily have the privilege to be able to protest um, given the consequences. That can be because of class, that can be because of immigration status, that can be you know, due to being documented or not. And yeah, as was mentioned before, um, last year we ran our first community survey called We Will Be Heard. Um, and it largely came about the fact that many surveys looking at the lives of LGBTQI plus people in the UK didn't ever look at the intersections between race and gender and sexual identity. So um, yeah, we decided to run one ourselves and the results weren't surprising, I'd say, but they were shocking nonetheless. Um, what we found was that a lot of the respondents had unfortunately been victims of hate crimes. Lots of respondents didn't feel safe in public. Lots of respondents didn't even feel safe in the communities that they were in. And lots of respondents didn't feel safe in LGBTQI plus specific um, groups and specific venues and events. 
And of course, that's largely why Black Pride was set up. Um, but what was really clear was that there was a clear call out um, and a clear response for community um, coalition and cohesion. And that really came in the form of LGBTQI plus groups, specifically for people of colour in the UK. There is a huge unmet demand, it seems, from the survey of these groups across the UK. Um, at the minute, it does seem that a lot of these groups are um, very concentrated in London, in other big cities, um, and there is a demand um, which isn't being met. Um, so many people did say um, throughout the survey that is what they want. Um, and those that did have those spaces, um, the attendance was really high. So for us at UK Black Pride, we try to represent these communities as far as possible, but um, unfortunately, given the size of our organization um, and our limitations, we can't necessarily represent everyone or have those community links that community and grassroots organizations do have at the minute. So what we've actually done um, and what will be announced soon is we have distributed um, a, a number like a number of funds to different grassroots organizations across the UK, um, up to 10,000 pounds to support these organizations to help build community in different geographical locations um, and help, yeah, help build, help create communities um, across the UK um, for LGBTQI plus people of color. Um, you know, what we find, and particularly given the political climate, it can be very isolating. It can also be very alienating um, to be, you know, a queer person of color. Um, and particularly in terms of activism, um, what's really important is community building, um, this idea of solidarity and cohesion, which, you know, are the systems we operate in are designed to um, knock this down. But um, yeah, it's really important to get that community spaces. Um, what we also did find, unfortunately, is that um, a large number of respondents have had issues with mental health and many have not been able to get adequate support from the healthcare system. And that's due to costs and that's due to um, waiting times. Um, naturally, obviously, we're looking at the intersections of you know, gender and sexual identity and race, but there's also the issue of class and how that impacts people. We're also, um, you know, working in a, you know, living crisis, cost of living crisis and housing crisis, which do disproportionately affect and impact people of colour. And then when you put LGBTQI plus people of colour and then particularly working class people of colour, um, they are disproportionately affected. And um, we also found out that trans people particularly, um, one of their major concerns is adequate um, access to adequate health care. So for us at UK Black Pride, there is this idea of supporting activists, supporting community builders. But one thing we find, I find that often that gets neglected is this idea of self-care. Um, many of us, I would say particularly our trans brothers and sisters, um, a lot of the activism we're faced with is that fighting to for our existence, our right to exist. And I don't think it's an understatement when we say it does have um, a considerable effect on us. Um, our, our mental state emotionally and physically. Um, so for us um, at UK Black Pride, a lot of what we want to work on is this idea of joy, joy in chosen family, joy in chosen community um, and building that community and that cohesion. So not only through funding these grassroots organizations, not only through our you know, annual celebration, which you know, grows every single year and it shows this clear, clear need and clear demand for this space for many people, but also through other work in terms of, you know, self-care workshops, um, day, day parties, things like that. It, while sometimes that sounds, you know, um, quite simple, um, for many of us um, who are battling, um, not only with our, you know, fighting for our right, you know, our gender identity, sexual identity, but also are facing life, um, which disproportionately affects us. So, you know, housing crisis, cost of living, having these spaces um, are so important. And obviously at UK Black Pride, we can't do everything. Um, we are quite a large organization. So having these connections with different groups across the UK, having these connections with different individuals is really important to us um, to try to sustainably build um, a network of people um, across the UK really. Yeah, and that's me, so thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I'm gonna hand straight over to Saskia. Hi, thanks, Ruth. Um, 
thank you so much for having me here today to the Stuart Hall Foundation and Code. Um, it's a real privilege to be speaking alongside Omi and Jason and Ruth. So yeah, um, I'm Saskia. I'm going to be speaking a little bit on behalf of Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrants. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of why we were set up and then talk about um, kind of how we sort of dealt with the pandemic as a group, um, what the impacts of the lockdown were, and then kind of where we are now. Um, so Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrant was set up in 2015 uh, by a group of queer activists who, um, as a response to the so-called migrant crisis, uh, that like political moment feels like quite a long time ago now, um, but saw you know hundreds of thousands of people trying to find safety within Europe and um, were coming up against the kind of sharp end of um, the violence of the border um, and the response in the UK was uh, you know particularly violent in its own way. Um, there was also uh, they felt a need to critique homo nationalism so that's the idea that uh, the claim by Europe and uh, I think the UK in particular really that um, this is like a good place to be gay based on the idea that sort of white Western nations are sort of progressive um, as opposed to the sort of imagined uh, backwards and homophobic Muslim migrant. Obviously that's like not a reality um, as we know, but it's a very powerful idea um, that really bolstered this kind of anti-migrant uh, sentiment that we saw and the kind of policies where you have a government on the one hand you know back in 2015 was celebrating having just legalized gay marriage um, whilst uh, operating these kind of death dealing uh, bordering practices um, it was also the time that the film prize was released which uh, dealt with the kind of true story of lesbians and gays support the minors which was a group of uh Queers in London, uh, but uh, fundraising for striking miners in the 1984 to 85 minor strikes. Um, and, you know, they had a huge impact in terms of fundraising, but also in terms of kind of shifting the place of gay people in the unions at a time where uh, sort of homophobia um, and sort of like the AIDS pandemic were having uh, devastating impacts on queer communities um, and they really saw themselves as standing in solidarity with uh, striking minors who at that time were also bearing the blunt, brunt of police and state violence more generally. Uh, so to come back to LGS migrants, um, the idea is that we stand in solidarity with community, communities facing state violence and media attacks. Uh, so in the current political climate, uh, it's migrants who bear the brunt of far-right violence, who face demonization in the media, who are criminalized by the state. Uh, so we try to use the strength of the queer community and our history of struggle to fight back in support of those um, who are experiencing the worst of government oppression today and understanding that like up the shared struggle. Uh, so how do we do this? So before the pandemic, you know, we had five years, we were about to celebrate our like five year anniversary, uh, just when lockdown hit, um, and we used a combination of fundraising, uh, campaigning and direct action to resist the violence of the border regime and to build queer solidarity. So one thing that we did pretty much every month was just as LGS miners had done in the eighties, uh, we would bucket shake in Soho, as a way of having conversations in kind of mainstream gay bars to about um, why we should be supporting migrants um, and kind of challenging the Islamophobia that unfortunately is very common uh, amongst certain white gay men. Um, and yeah, we also uh, did all kinds of other things. One of our perhaps most famous uh, things was supporting the Stance of 15, which was a group of activists who uh, chain themselves to a flight that was deporting people to Nigeria and Ghana uh, from Stansted Airport. Um, and yeah, everything in between those actions, uh, having parties and uh, going on demos, doing anti-fascist stuff. Yeah, like we also did a lot of campaigning against um, Virgin, uh, the airline 
and managed to get them because they were using kind of gay uh, ideas about being gay friendly uh, to sell their airline whilst also deporting migrants we managed to stop them uh working with the home office we also for a long time tried to stop BA doing the same but they just really hanging on to their roots as uh, an imperial um operator and absolutely refused even though they were they fund a lot of prides um but anyway things have changed since then and now the government relies much more on charter flights because uh people are sort of resisting too much on commercial airlines uh resisting deportations that is okay uh so yeah when lockdown hit we had to kind of rethink how we operated um so we did we organized online for uh two years and some of our some of the activists who are part of lgs migrants started london queer mutual aid group um we did a lot of online fundraising uh, amongst the queer community, which was just unbelievably successful in terms of raising money compared to Bucket Shaky and Soho. Like people are so much more generous online than when they're trying to go to a gay bar on a Friday night. Um, so yeah, we raised uh, 13,000 pounds in our first fundraiser for different uh, queer um, and migrant groups, sorry, mainly migrant groups. Um, and then uh, we had an art sale uh, where we raised £12,000 to house queer people who were living in the Moria refugee camp in Lesbos in Greece. Um, so yeah, those, that was really exciting to see how people uh, were still engaging with resistance, even when uh, we were stuck at home a lot of the time. We also were able to do a lot more political education, which um, we had been wanting to do offline like in person but we're really struggling to find a venue because there's no queer community spaces in London um so yeah we pinched an idea from Sisters Uncut and we ran online events called LGSM Learns on subjects like no cops at pride we had one on um the no outsiders tobacco which happened in 2018 and prevent uh, which is part of the government's uh, so-called anti-terrorism strategy uh on things like homo nationalism and abolition um and in terms of kind of demos on the ground we supported black lives matter demos um sarah everard and uh yeah demonstrations and kill the bill activities um yeah and like what changed for us uh you know meeting online it's really useful in some ways and like you know we're still able to have hybrid meetings and stuff which is very useful um but i think we all felt the loss of having uh, a sort of radical queer community really keenly um particularly more vulnerable people didn't join um so we lost members of the group who were in the asylum system and as omi was saying like you know often people who needed support most uh, not, and you know, as a group, we're not just there for queer migrants, but it's always been really important to our activism that there are people who are experiencing the asylum system who are, you know, working to resist it also. Um, yeah, and the kind of political energy that we've seen over the past few three, sorry, the past few years has really transformed LGS migrants. Uh, and what we're trying to do uh, some in some good ways and some less good ways. So yeah, as I said, it was amazing to have the chance to like really focus on political education. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter and the kind of growing abolitionist movement in the UK has really enriched our political understanding of what the struggle is and like what it is we're trying to achieve as a group. Um, on the less good side, uh, as, yeah, again, Omi was talking about the rise of turfism, uh, which I would see as, uh, well, I think, yeah, like we would see as like a backlash to Black Lives Matter shows that, you know, the homo nationalism um, that we were challenging back in 2015 has like completely changed. So this kind of mainstreaming of transphobia um, by sort of mainstream media. And I was just reading about how Keir Starmer just went on mum's net and was talking about, you know, he was really pro-women by which he meant uh, anti-trans. Um, all of these things kind of show that like queer people maybe don't have the same privileges that they did not so long ago, like Theresa May, who we spent many a long 
uh, our day um, campaigning against was like gonna do things that made life easier for non-binary people, obviously again, pitting queer people against migrants in this really uh, cynical way, but that seems like an unimaginable political moment compared to where we are now. Um, and yeah, obviously trans people are not divisible from like the wider queer community and it affects all of us uh, as, you know, a very dangerous moment when uh, fascists are like very openly being uh, anti-trans and homophobic. Um, so yeah, I think it's a real moment where we're trying to reconsider how we go forward and what our priorities are. Like obviously our priorities are always resisting the hostile environment and resisting racist bordering practices. Um, but the ways in which we do that have to change with uh, the changing face of state violence. So um, I think I'll leave it there for now. I look forward to talk about it more. Thanks so much, Saskia. Um, okay, I'll hand straight over to Jason. Uh, hi everyone, um, sorry that I'm so close, but I do not have my glasses, so I need to be able to read my notes properly, um, so I'm kind of like in the camera. Um, so I'm approaching this topic from the perspective of someone who works as a writer, journalist and historian, rather than someone who is necessarily directly involved in direct action. But I want to really focus on the kind of like um, political priorities of gay men, particularly in light of the monkeypox pandemic, um, which we saw over the past year. So. Amongst the kind of broader LGBTQ spectrum, gay men occupy quite an interesting and unique position in that the political concerns of gay men over the past 10 years have mostly focused on civil rights such as gay marriage and blood donation and have kind of configured gay men outside of real um, remits of social vulnerability and proximity to harm and proximity to state violence as well. Um, so when the World Health Organization declared um, the monkeypox pandemic outside of endemic re regions in Africa um, as a global health emergency, the messaging was focused on men who have sex with men, particularly men who have sex with men and have multiple partners, as the at-risk group which was most in need for urgent vaccination and for urgent health messaging. And there was an incredibly split response from this, um, both from gay men themselves and from well many allies and also from homophobic people. Um, the kind of argument which again went against the World Health Organization was this idea that by singling out gay men as particularly vulnerable to monkeypox and to this um, disease, um, we were effectively repeating the mistakes made in the AIDS crisis of like overly associating one specific group with um, an illness or with some kind of contamination. And the problems with that discourse have been twofold. It one neglects the history of gay men's activism and the reality of like how gay men had fought AIDS in the past, um, which will I will come on to. But it also betrayed a kind of respectability politics, which has kind of seized and taken hold of gay activist politics um, in the past 10 years, which has meant that people are more able to articulate a kind of degree of vulnerability and of persecution um, for gay men um, in particular. So in my work as a journalist, because I often write about health and sexuality, my first priority was to contact people who have been working as activists in the sexual health sector for many years. So through the AIDS crisis and through to now looking at the monkeypox pandemic. And I worked alongside the activists, um, Mark Thompson and Will Nutland from Prepster, um, who basically took this approach that actually targeting vaccine resources at gay men, at men who have sex with men in particular, is the most effective way to stop the spread of the disease and that inoculating the population of gay men who um, are more at risk of monkeypox was what was going to help protect border populations. And for some reason, you know, this was seen as quite a controversial position, this idea that, you know, actually giving resources to people would be something which, you know, was homophobic. And as I said before, this misunderstanding comes from a misunderstanding of history. So a lot of what we learn about the history of AIDS and HIV in this country is of the kind of scapegoating of gay communities and of this idea that gay communities were painted as particularly dirty. So we had the chief constable of Manchester in about 1998 saying that, you know, um, gays deserve the aid crisis because they're rolling around in the cesspool of their own filth. 
But when the Thatcher government started to take AIDS seriously and HIV seriously and start to develop health messaging around it, the messaging that you had was very generalized. It was this idea that anybody can get AIDS, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, and that it didn't discriminate and it didn't particularly care about your identity. And what we found was that, you know, this was not the case. Whilst you did have people outside of the kind of like main targeted group um, or the main affected group who were contracting HIV and AIDS, it was still the case that disproportionately um, people of the MSM risk group were getting infected, dying and having their friends disappear. So a lot of my work has been um, speaking to generations of older gay men to talk about their lives in the AIDS crisis. And they describe kind of acuteness of loss um, of tragedy, which is not the same experience of other demographic groups. Um, so that is, discourse has kind of carried along into the kind of like present moment at the moment where people say, you know, well, anyone can get monkey bots, it doesn't discriminate. And whilst this is well intentioned, um, it does effectively mean that um, a lot of this activism ends up becoming misdirected. So Back in 1992, you had the setup of the group Gay Men Fighting AIDS. And the reason why this group was set up was because gay men felt that actually the communications around AIDS and the health crisis and the HIV crisis was not sufficiently targeted towards gay men. And it was really generalized. And it was assumed that, you know, gay men, that AIDS and HIV were just everyone's problems and that this wasn't reflective of the um, experiences and realities that were affecting gay men. And when you get back into say like the history of activism in the past kind of 12 years there has been this tension between activist groups of gay men in terms of how they consider themselves as citizens um, of this country and as kind of like hygienic citizens as well and what I mean by hygienic citizens is you know people who participate in this country and are seen as you know people who are clean and who are like sexually prudent um so as I said, there's kind of like two main strands of activism which have been the focus of gay men in the past kind of 10 years have been gay marriage and blood donation. So I want to focus quickly on blood donation, um, the freedom to donate group in particular. So the freedom to donate group focused on equalizing the, um, basically on ending the so-called homophobic um, blood donation ban. Um, this was a ban which said that, you know, a gay man would have to abstain um, from sexual relationships with men for six months, even if they were in a uh, romantic monogamous relationship um, before they were allowed to donate blood. And what these activists made a claim, of, what these activists tried to say was that basically, um, this should be an individualized risk assessment. And, you know, if I'm a non-promiscuous monogamous gay man, then I'm no more of a risk than a promiscuous um, heterosexual woman. And on the surface, you know, this might look correct. This might look like, well, you know, gay men are being particularly um, targeted for um, certain behaviors which exist in other communities. But the truth is not only do we have higher instances of promiscuity amongst gay men, which is fine, um, which is something that we don't argue for the right to enough, um, but also the disproportionate rates of HIV and bloodborne illnesses are still um, more prevalent amongst MSM groups, even with the spread of HIV and AIDS amongst, you know, different demographic groups. And what this ultimately betrayed was this kind of like really classed, um, really middle class, really neoliberal model of gay man, which was starting to emerge and which really emerged in the 1990s as well. Um, this idea of the gay man who would, you know, tear down the barriers of legal marriage and of adoption and be able to live this kind of like picket fence, nuclear family life. Um, in that what these activists ended up doing was not building coalitions with the groups that they needed to. So often with freedom to donate, there would never be coalitions made with, you know, um, groups looking for black blood donors. So there are, you know, black people who are unable to donate blood because perhaps they had malaria as a child or because they have visited certain regions in Africa, which means that they are restricted. And um, there are properties of black people's blood which are necessary for um, other black people. There are not properties of gay men's blood which are especially necessary for blood stocks. Um, so the failures to build coalitions there and to understand the kind of complex picture of um, blood supply and of blood donation has meant that this ended up being considered as a really privileged middle class and really kind of like isolated model of activism which really looked at the individual and the kind of me and rather than looking at the kind of um, broader scope and the broader picture. And it also has meant that in both this and also in the monkeypox pandemic, you see the same kind of actors basically saying like, well, we're not promiscuous, 
we're not the ones who are only at risk. You know, lots of straight people have lots of sex. So, you know, why are you focusing on us? And again, this neglected to recognize sex workers or, you know, promiscuous people as people who are very much part of our community. Um, it failed to recognize that, you know, people who have sex at sex on premise spend this at sex and premise venues, often sometimes some of the most isolated um, queer people in our communities as well, as you know, people who need specific advocacy and need to be included in this kind of figure of gay men and of the health of gay men too. So that is to say basically that not all activism amongst the gay community has been good activism. A lot of it has actually been bad and has actually been detrimental to other demographic groups and also even to gay men within themselves. And it's led to this kind of autocad mobilism in the past 10 years and this kind of like erosion of the facilities to think about vulnerability in the context of gay men, which has led to the situation where people are saying, no vaccines for gay men, please, uh, we're clean, even though we needed those vaccines. And it took me kind of like, you know, research, me and other people kind of into like really research and write about these topics and really disseminate this information to kind of like counter the misinformation that was going out there or counter the narratives which were developing, um, the kind of like false claims that it's a repeat of the AIDS crisis to target resources rather than the AIDS crisis um, mistakes being, you know, not distributing resources. And that meant that the focus was not on the fact that sexual health services are incredibly underfunded and have been gutted. It was not on the fact that, you know, the government was refusing to release vaccines for a long time, that for a long time vaccines were very focused in London as well, which meant that you had gay men who were having to travel down from Manchester, Edinburgh, whatever else, um, to be able to access vaccines. And it meant that we weren't able to also have a conversation about the equality and inequality of access to these certain technologies as well. So. With vaccine distribution in London, for a long time, the vaccine distribution was basically as a kind of like first come first out basis, um, standard a massive queue outside Guy the St. Thomas's Hospital in London Bridge. And speaking to the activist Mark Thompson, who advocates particularly for the kind of sexual health um, needs of black gay men, what was said was that, well, individuals from ethnic minority communities are more likely to be closeted and are less likely to be happy to stand in a queue where they are easily identifiable as gay men and perhaps are putting themselves at some kind of social risk by going forth to um, go and get their vaccine. But we kind of weren't able to properly forward these conversations to the public domain about equality of access and how um, monkeypox information and monkeypox vaccines could be distributed to people in a more discreet way because we were trying to argue in the first place that this was needed. And this, of course, comes into, you know, the entire um, government picture of austerity and of the kind of gutting of hospital and sexual health services. So um, the recent um, health secretary um, in the Liz Truss administration, Therese Coffey, um, effectively said that, you know, she wasn't looking to prioritise um, a second round of vaccines um, for MSM for monkeypox because she felt it was just not a priority and not an issue which was um, particularly important. And that is meant, you know, for plenty of gay men like myself, there is no information now on when or how we might get our second monkeypox vaccines. Um, some people are just being called up randomly about monkeypox um, and told, oh, there's a second vaccine available, but there seems to be no standardization. I mean, I got my first vaccine quite a while ago, so I should be eligible for a second vaccine, but I simply haven't received that information. And part of the issue is also that when the monkeypox um, pandemic first started to pop up as this kind of like new scary um, issue that was happening, you also had a lot of people outside of the constituency of gay men or LGBTQ people kind of saying, well, what about me? Uh, some people kind of thought this was going to be the second coming of COVID and thought that, you know, this kind of priority of gay men was um, in some way detrimental to their own ability to access vaccines and to be safe. Um, even though the logic goes that protecting the most at risk group is what helps to protect broader groups as well, but people refuse to listen to that. But as it became evident that, you know, people weren't getting monkeypox in the same way that people were getting COVID, eventually the kind of noise and the concern around it just died down and died down and died down and died down. And the reason for that is because people are failing to comprehend the social vulnerabilities of gay men and often thinking of themselves um, as well. Um, it means that as soon as people realized that they were no longer at risk, it was like, oh, well, I don't need to talk about this anymore, um, even though they might present a risk to their friends or to other gay men that they don't even know. Um, there was this kind of feeling of abandonment, I feel, amongst some gay men, but it was like, well, since this issue no longer affects you, why is this now, you know, not, no longer um, this big priority? And 
Yeah, so again, it speaks to the ways in which the social vulnerabilities of gay men in the past 10 years haven't been invisibilized, um, partially um, because of the kind of very middle class individualized mode of activism, which has taken hold um, amongst gay men and has been the most loud and has been the most visible. Um, but it means that beyond just the issue of the monkeypox epidemic, you've also had cases like um, the Stephen Paul killings of uh, men of who he had met over Grindr. Um, the kind of, um, there was another case of a man who had been drugging his victims with GBH and killing them as well. And the responses to this have effectively been put into the hands of the state because of a lack of kind of like coordinated, organized gay male movement as we had that existed, you know, back in the days of the AIDS crisis. And so it means that, you know, sometimes I've looked at, you know, some documents or some responses from the Home Secretary in response to some of these kind of like chemsex crimes, which have looked to criminal, further criminalize chemsex and to kind of like target um, this activity in these parties um, and, you know, take a castle solution to the kind of issues and risks that are going on there rather than a kind of harm reduction solution. And often people are not willing to talk about, you know, the realities of what goes on in say the chemsex scene or the risks that might you might encounter on Grindr because of this kind of like social sanitization, um, because of this shame, because of this want to kind of disassociate gay men from the um, more extremes of, you know, sex and the pleasure. And, to go on to pleasure it also means that you know often something that has been missing from gay activism um, for decades, and I don't think that gay men have you know really focused enough or tried to uh, properly articulate or advocate for is this right to pleasure as well. Um, so we see anytime any kind of health crisis pops up or any kind of sexual or any kind of crime which is takes hold in a kind of sexual context. The answer, whether it's from the state, police, media, or from spectators, is that, well, you know, these gay men enjoy sex too much and they enjoy pleasure too much. And, you know, if they lived a more conservative life and they didn't think so much about, you know, their orgasms, then they would be safer and they would be able to help themselves. And an example of where this really popped up was with the, um, agitation um, for PrEP to be rolled out on NHS England. So PrEP, for people who don't know, is pre exposure prophylaxis. It's a medication that people can take either topically or once a day, um, which prevents them from uh, acquiring HIV, even if they sleep with a person who is HIV positive and non-detectable. Um, and detectable, sorry. And what we had from, there were headlines in the Daily Mail which spoke about this kind of like party drug, which is something which enabled gay men to, you know, keep on barebacking and having lots of promiscuous sex. And the pushback sometimes from many aspects of the gay community were, well, we're not promiscuous and, you know, we're not just pleasure seeking, you know, this is just about safety. When the pushback actually should have been, yes, we are having sex. Yes, we do care about pleasure. Pleasure and intimacy are very important um, for us and they're very important for lots of people. And we should be able to maximize pleasure in the safest way possible. But often that focus is completely absent from a lot of discourse, from a lot of activism um, to do with gay men. Um, if you'll forgive me, just because I can't really see, but I'm just gonna have a look at my notes and make sure I've not missed anything. Um, so yeah, so the difficulty with the figures of gay men that we often have in Britain is that this lack of coalition building with other groups, either within different constituencies of gay men or outside of gay men themselves means that we're kind of like lost as a subject, I think. Politically, there's this difficulty in terms of where to place us, particularly white gay men, I would say. And what's interesting is that what kind of has run through this sort of activism which has resisted um, the idea that gay men are particularly sexually, socially vulnerable in terms of being sexual citizens and that has agitated particularly for you know the freedom to donate blood and for gay marriages that it's based on this kind of 1990s model of the affluent gay man who is able to access you know home ownership and a nuclear family and um really stable employment for example and the question that a lot of gay men don't ask themselves is is this neoliberal dream even achievable anymore? Um, is it achievable not just for gay men, but even for heterosexual people? Um, are people able to own homes and have children? And how has this kind of neoliberal dream, which was sold to gay men of home and abortivity, been completely obliterated by the con political conditions that we find themselves in? So I'm someone who, if I had, you know, been in the same economic um, conditions individually 30 years ago, I might have been in the position where I could get married, own a home, have a partner, um, have children. But these are conditions which don't exist 
in the same way anymore that are not just not as achievable, which is the great irony of this kind of activism which really runs through um, those different focuses. So sometimes the question is, you know, what is the future of gay sex and what is the future of the kind of gay male subjectivity? There was this kind of view that gay men have perhaps like almost transcended um, this category of oppression and that focus needed to be more on, well, queer men of colour, yes, but also on other groups um, within the LGBT community. So, you know, trans people and um, lesbians and the issues which affect them uniquely, which they absolutely must. And sometimes gay men have become kind of complacent in the activism that they pursue and not been able to configure that they might also be vulnerable and that rights can be taken away from them and that, you know, there can be backslides. But I think the answer is to look at, you know, that coalition building with other groups and to look at, you know, where rights are stood away and where rights have been given. Um, thinking about things like you know, bodily autonomy and the right to you know, access a medication like PrEP is not divorced from the right of trans people to you know, be able to access um, hormones and gender affirming, um, gender affirming procedures or the rights of women to be able to access abortion. Um, so ultimately my research has attempted to kind of like really tie together um, these different kinds of activism and kind of try to politicize gay men and understand that, you know, they're not a group which can afford to be complacent and can afford to rest on this kind of neoliberal lie which was built in the 1990s and that the situation is just as urgent for us as it is for anyone else in the LGBTQ community. community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so we have just under 25 minutes left for the discussion before we open it up to audience questions. Um, so those of you at home, please do feel welcome to send those in using the Q&A button. Um, but before we turn to those, uh, Omi, Saskia, Jason, please do um, join me back on screen. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I want to start uh, our discussion um, by picking up on this question of homo-nationalism that Saskia uh, named explicitly. Um, but that all three of you actually raised in different and really important ways. <laughs> um, so one part of this is that we see increasingly this argument um, being made globally that states should protect and legislate in favour of queer people, or at least in favour of LGB people, because that's economically beneficial on a state level. So in other words, arguments about folding queer people into the citizenry um, that that's financially beneficial for the state. And we see similar arguments happening with regards to corporations so that diversity is um, financially beneficial basically. And of course, this is really visible at many prides. And this was touched on, um, Saskia gave the example of British Airways funding pride while also deporting migrants. Um, but I know that UK Black Pride um, is one example of a pride that really invests in challenging this mainstream narrative of how queerness benefits capitalism. So Amy, you already mentioned in your presentation the importance of the ways in which that um, inaugural Black Pride survey addressed the factor of socioeconomic class. Um, but I wanted to start by asking if you could say a bit more about how and why this narrative that I've described, which links queer people to economic benefits, so for example, Pride and corporations, is challenged by the work of UK Black Pride and perhaps also um, in your work more generally. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess it's quite um, a broad thing. There's a, diff there's a few different ways we can look at this. Um, largely in terms of like Black Pride and the idea of like corporations of Black Pride, um, we are very cautious about who we partner with. Um, because, um, yeah, I do think sometimes the narrative is pushed, you know, the UK is a really gay friendly country, these, you know, um, and we see this, I think, sometimes with narratives when we look at um, countries abroad and um, specific laws, etc. cetera. Um, and whilst they do exist, um, I, yeah, the UK is very often complicit in stuff. So for example, Pride partnering with the Home Office, etc. cetera. Um, so I think in recent years, we've we've definitely been a lot more cautious about who we partner with. Um, yeah, particularly recently. Um, and also just kind of dispelling that narrative of um, the UK or the Western world being really LGBT friendly versus um, the rest of the world not being not being so. Um, looking at this idea, for example, even like in African countries that it's um, an African to be LGBT, um, like looking at Qatar, sometimes I think the narrative is pushed that um, a recent narrative I've really seen is like we shouldn't be going to these countries because of so and so, um, whereas gay people exist in these countries, they live in these countries, 
many of us are from countries where it's not um you know I come from a country where it's it's there exist gay people exist um so I think very often we look at it very black and white um and I guess a lot of our work sometimes is trying to ch challenge that narrative um both through who we you know how we run our events and how we run our organizations but also just um I guess kind of challenging that narrative as well um and challenging sometimes you know other pride organizations um I guess it's a bit of hypocr hypocrisy really um yeah thanks so much Omi um <laughs> Okay, so picking up on this point that you make about um, the importance of challenging these kind of false and completely ahistorical narratives of kind of British enlightenment and acceptance <laughs> of queer people, I want to ask about um, solidarity and allyship. And of course, there's really important, these are really important and kind of historically rich concepts, and they're crucial if we're going to build broad based alliances. But <laughs> You know, we're reflecting on the, the COVID-19 pandemic thus far, and I'm thinking specifically about the increase in the kind of rhetoric of allyship that we saw, for example, on social media in the wake of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests and how this rhetoric often came from maybe like unexpected or new quarters. And then, you know, there were subsequent critiques of a kind of version of allyship that is empty or that's seen as a kind of performance. So for example, there's been criticisms of declarations of allyship that actually involve um, white people centering themselves. So um, I wanna start by asking you Saskia, given the work that you do with lesbians and gays support the migrants and you named you know, solidarity specifically as crucial to your work. I want to first direct this question to you, but then I'd love to hear from you as well, Omi and Jason, um, if you'd like to contribute. Um, so to start with Saskia, how are these concepts of solidarity and allyship put into practice in the work of LGSM and how do you think about them more broadly? Um, thanks, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I, the thing that always, uh, <laughs> comes to mind when people ask this question is like our name which I feel like in some ways is like kind of a terrible name because lesbians are gay support the migrants makes it sound like we're somehow divisible from each other when like the whole point of solidarity is like recognizing our shared like not that everyone experiences it in the same way or that it falls equally on all of us but that like we're in a shared struggle against the same forces oppressing us um and like obviously it's a really important reference to a moment in queer history where that solidarity was like um really put into practice like in the 80s at the minor strike um yeah really interesting listening to jason talking about like how queer activism is not always about like solidarity and often it's about like throwing like sick people disabled people or migrants under the bus so i guess what we're trying to do in our activism is building on a solidarity you know like the importance of those bucket shapes where like, like going into bars where you know I find <laughs> I find it really scary to do I really don't like doing it because like if you want to feel really uncomfortable as a lesbian uh who like yeah go into like a gay bar in Soho on a Friday night and like everyone is so tall and so white and like just like does not want to hear what you have to say about migrant rights and like I'm like I'm just too nervous for this I'll watch everyone's bags um but like yeah like the importance of doing that is like if we like if we have resources we need to operationalize them and like put them in service of like fighting the very worst aspects of state oppression and like it's so clear like this past week has shown I mean every week there's a new thing but like you know the government basically has like a concentration camp uh where people are being kept in tents and like with absolutely no view of being able to leave um in like Kent is it Kent yeah um and like children going missing from hotels where they're supposed to be being protected I mean who is protected by the home office but you know these are people who have like experienced some of the worst things it's possible to experience in their struggle to get to the UK and then being treated with such uh contempt and violence um you know if we have any resources if we have anything to give like that is what the solidarity is right it's like whatever you have like that is what we have to 
because like yeah all of these things can fall back onto anyone <laughs> and it's about standing in solidarity so that we can protect all of us as best we can I hope I've articulated that <laughs> um, um no that, that's really interesting Saskia thank you and <laughs> I guess, I mean, something else that you actually touched on in your presentation is about this understanding of solidarity in terms of like understanding the necessary kind of interconnect interconnectedness of struggles that might be cast as separate. <laughs> so for example, you made this really important link with um, just in describing turfism as a form of fascism and also highlighting that partly the recent kind of rise in turfism has also been a, a response to the BLM <laughs> um, protests in 2020. Um, <laughs> And Omi, you also highlighted this and you speak about um, UK Black Pride and how the, the um, like how solidarity is thought of on a global scale, but, the, but how you highlight that that's already interconnected because of the legacy of British imperialism, colonialism, for example. <laughs> um, so, I, okay, so I'm continuing thinking about um, these struggles and like the interconnectedness of struggles. <laughs> um, in your presentation, in your sorry, in your presentation, Jason, um, you drew links between experiences of HIV, AIDS, COVID nineteen, and monkeypox. Um, for example, in terms of kind of government response and stigma. <laughs> but I'm wondering, um, along this line, I'm wondering about like I'd be really interested to hear about this in terms of resources <laughs> and resources that communities have developed, and whether this has come up at all in the research. <laughs> That you're doing so for I know for example that um that question of connections between the COVID-19 pandemic and the HIV AIDS epidemic have also been explored in a USA context and there's a 2021 study I'm thinking of that noted um similarities to the early AIDS of the HIV AIDS pandemic that included a disjointed and bungled government response that endangered lives and produced both fear and stigma. And these authors also found that the lessons learned and the trauma experienced early in the HIV AIDS crisis actually helped urban gay areas respond to COVID-19 quickly and effectively, especially in the face of early federal government paralysis. So they found that neighborhood-based LGBTIQ plus healthcare organizations were supporting state responses. And this is particularly in neighborhoods in the Bay Area that have been known as gay neighborhoods since around the 1980s. So I'm wondering, Jason, whether or in what ways this notion of resources and learnings from previous crises um, actually being deployed in our current context or more current crises came up in your own research? Um, this is a good question. Um, I think it depends on like who we're expecting these resources to come from. So for, let's say the resources which kind of started to spring up in the kind of like late 80s and 1990s. So the work that I do kind of focuses on Black activism in particular. And a lot of it was very kind of like locally focused. So we had black liners, which were set up in someone's bedroom in um, Brixton, uh, which was a kind of like phone line for people to be able to kind of like get in touch, learn about sexual health, and also do access kind of like care services and wellbeing as well. And um, in around the early 1990s, you had the setup of Big Up, which came out of, um, which was kind of inspired by um, gay men fighting AIDS, uh, which specifically looked to develop resources for black gay men, um, in terms of sexual health prevention and teaching them about HIV and AIDS and also in providing kind of pastoral support um, to HIV positive men. Um, but also something that was quite key um, about some of these services, which I do think is that was missing in the response to monkeypox, um, even on the community level was that um, in those in the 1990s, what you could also access alongside um, health advice and emotional advice, also legal advice as well. So um, this is how you can arrange housing for yourself if you are a HIV positive person, or this is how to you know, tackle discrimination from your employer if you find that you're being sacked because you've been discovered to be HIV positive. And something I felt that was entirely absent was that um, a lot of the men who contracted monkeypox would have the quarantine for whatever a month, um, that would have implications for their ability to get to work. Um, Nothing came out of that in terms of, you know, lobbying the government for sick pay, um, for certain provisions, for ensuring that, you know, employers were not sacking these men uh, for having to take extended periods off work to make sure that they were allowed to take extended periods off work as well to be able to recover um, from monkeypox. So unfortunately, it's a bit of a difficult one. In some, in some ways, there have been um, resources which were applied across. So that's mostly in terms of communication. 
um, and in terms of information distribution, which I don't think, which I think is the most vital resource, to be honest, even if it's a kind of like a less tangible um, thing. But there were some lessons which don't seem to have really transferred over. And I think that it speaks to a lack of kind of like AIDS education in this country, um, a kind of complacency as well, as I said. Thanks. Um, something else that I wanted to ask about that I just want to switch to now to make sure we have time is the kind of specific legislative changes that we saw happening in the UK at the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I think I'm going to direct this question to Saskia to begin with. Um, so as Omi already mentioned, the Policing, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Act came into force in April 2022. And this, as you know, was in spite of considerable protest and criticism from activists and legal experts, which included um, really dire warnings about the kind of the curtailment of the right to protest, um, warnings that were effectively ignored by the government. So now that this act is part of UK law, um, I'm wondering, Saskia, how it's already impacted um, or also how you expect um, it will continue to impact the work of LGSM, but also activist work more generally? Yeah, obviously, as a group, we've followed uh, the passage of that bill uh, pretty closely because, uh, you know, for context, it criminalises basically every aspect of protest you can imagine. Um, we've we've seen I guess we've kind of seen this coming as a group as well you know I mentioned the stance of 15 earlier and they were uh you know a, a charge uh on under terrorism law which they were expected you know as I said they locked themselves onto a plane um I think they were expecting kind of trespass or something um and yeah, the terrorism charges, which, you know, they were convicted under, it was overturned on appeal and they got kind of very light uh, sentences, but still like, it was kind of, it was like a real watershed moment for, um, you know, what the state was willing to do, what the prosecution service was willing to do to stop people engaging in civil protests or like, you know, resisting um, the government. So yeah, it's it's not like a huge surprise, but it's it's obviously very disturbing that the government can and like all of these things always fall unequally, right? Like the reason those people chose to be in the Sounds of Fifteen is because they all had settled states in the UK, like you know they all had British citizenship. They weren't gonna be like at the sharp end of government oppression, um, but you know that it affects all of us in terms and you know we do always think about these things if we go on a protest if we do kind of spicy actions we try and be mindful of the fact that you know like people who uh might be in the asylum process or whatever like if you have a less secure right to stay in the uk then you have to be quite careful of oh, well, like how you resist the government because any pretext to get rid of you and they will um but also it's like really galvanizing right like if the government is uh embarking on this program of basically saying like if you're too annoying we'll arrest you um then there's all the more reason to be annoying <laughs> in some ways like obviously uh without putting people at risk who like you know we want to protect um it shows that like process works and it's freaking people out like i we were at a process so the lgb alliance which is a a a hate group that targets trans people um and apparently it's mainly straight people unsurprisingly but uh yeah they had their annual conference in Westminster recently um and so lots of people came and protested outside it and like you know like the police are obviously there and they were able to kind of dictate like what kind of things you were able to shout on the picket line on um, well yeah like at the protest because you're in those kinds of risks um because of the new laws but also just by being there and shouting like people who had infiltrated the conference were like yeah you were really freaking them out like you, you know like being noisy and annoying works like looking like the just of oil protesters like what they're doing is working because it's it's showing that like you can bring in the harshest laws you want people will still resist uh so yeah on the kind of flip side of it being like horrifying and authoritarian 
it also is kind of like, yeah, we, we can really spook you. <laughs> so yeah, obviously mostly bad, but some good things. Thanks. Um, Omi and Jason, is there anything you want to add to that or in relation to anything else that we've been speaking about? Um, I thought what um, Saskia was saying about, you know, the about solidarity um, was quite interesting. And I also, I've been kind of thinking about it recently in terms of where solidarity and allyship can be really unhelpful um, and where um, sometimes you might have actors, particularly who act individually, um, who might actually disturb the efforts of um, different groups. Um, so I think the big conversation people have been having has been around Qatar and LGBTQ rights and the World Cup and things like that. And I have some frustrations with that because um, some people seem to be more concerned with the fact that, you know, affluent tourists are not able to hold hands than the gross labour exploitations which are going on in this country, and that seems to be the priority. But you had, for example, I'm just going to name him, you had Peter Tatchell um, fly over there and decide to hold a solo protest, which he claimed was the first LGBTQ protest in Qatar, and, you know, citation needed, really frustrating. Um, then making this entire song and dance about supposedly being arrested, he wasn't. Um, and then flying up to Sydney the next day and then getting interviewed by the Guardian. And in doing that, so people who were part of the kind of a signal group from Qatar were um, incredibly frustrated by that. Um, people have repeatedly said to activists like this, you know, sometimes when you do this kind of like interference, you decide to just go to this country to do your own thing. Um, it can lead to really negative consequences for um, the LGBTQ people who actually live there and can't just get on the flight to Sydney in Australia. Um, this is something which is, you know, has been going on historically. Um, so sometimes with um, white LGBTQ activists coming to um, African countries as well to protest certain like laws or whatever actions um, or who have called for sanctions on these countries as well in with this kind of claim to be in solidarity um, with the people of these countries and have ended up making the situation worse so I always think that activism requires a lot of deference and a lot of humility um, solidarity and allyship allyship I should say sorry um, but often allyship can be very much about the individual and making the individual feel better and like they're themselves taking a stand and there are so many cases where people do not ultimately want to consider themselves as part of a collective and work with the collective and also to defer to you know people with the more direct experiences and with the more direct um experience of vulnerability and oppression. I'm a gay man, okay, yes, it would be very techy for me to go to Qatar, but I'm not the direct victim of the Qatari regime. And um, sometimes, I think that sometimes with allyship, people feel that they need to kind of like project themselves into that situation to be able to empathize and to be able to act. And actually sometimes that can be deeply unhelpful. So yeah, I just wanted to get that off my chest. Thank you. Um, Omi, is there anything you wanna add? No, I just uh, agree with everything I <laughs> said, basically. But yeah, nothing. Um, so Jason, you've, you've touched on some really important points there. Um, I imagine there's lots of people coming to this event, you know, about activism, who maybe are wanting to get involved and do things, maybe are facing their own struggles or are hearing about some of the things that we've touched on today and are feeling like they want to, go off and do something or get involved in some way I mean the three of you in some ways are involved in quite different forms of <laughs> activism um but maybe I'd like to start with you Omi if that's okay because you're just um you do so many things <laughs> it's quite you know UK Black Pride but also these various um swimming organizations um uh yeah so you're you you do a lot of different you're involved in a lot of different forms of activism so I guess the question I'd want to ask is if there I'm sure there are many people here who are themselves experienced activists, but I imagine there are also people who are um, looking for advice and trying to figure out where to get started. Is there any advice that you, you know, from your own experience that you tend to share with um, younger or less experienced activists? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I feel, yeah, I, I guess a lot of like the work that I've been doing I haven't necessarily gone in with the idea of like yeah I'm gonna be an activist and I think actually that's quite important um it's this idea of like not centering yourself on the work you're doing um as we've just spoken about but rather um yeah I think it's I would say actually my advice would be go in go slow um actually um speak to people with lived experience speak to people who have experience on you know the ground um I think actually my experience having worked in you know various community organizations is very often people do come in and they're like yeah I'm gonna help da, 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 da. um 
and pe- you know we can all end up doing more harm than good and I've also been in that situation where I've probably done more harm than good um and I've also had to take a step back and ask myself am I doing this you know to massage my ego or am I doing this because you know and I think that's probably a question that we should all ask ask ourselves in any kind of work we do um the intentions but also yeah I think the real expertise is with um people with with the lived experience um really and that's what I'd say is pay attention to thanks um we've got about two minutes before we go to audience Q&A so is there anything you want to add um Jason and Saskia to that um I guess just listening to both Jason and Omi I guess it is relevant as well and like the idea of not centering yourself but also looking beyond kind of the like even though you know we focus on borders a lot like looking beyond like national borders so I think what Jason's talking about and the idea of like internationalism and seeing our struggles as connected not just within the UK but like with you know (laughs) oppressed people around the world and like yeah I just reinforcing that idea that I think both of you are talking about that it's about being part of a collective um and that can you know it's it's about like listening as much as doing I think a lot of the time so yeah that's just what I want to add thanks but not flying straight to Qatar and staging and not listening to any activists on the ground basically yeah um okay great we've already got um quite a few questions in the Q&A so I'm going to go straight to those uh, the first one is um, a question for you, Saskia. I think it was when you were describing the events being run by LGSM. Um, someone is asking how they can sign up for these events um, and says that it's great that they're online, helps a lot from a disability perspective too, and the perspective of living far from big centres with financial difficulties. Uh, yeah, so LGSM Learns are still online events, unfortunately. We're still, as I said, sort of transitioning, like how do we work? Uh, how are we working kind of in this like weird like the pandemic is still going on we're sort of meeting in person and online um I'll just send learns will still be online and we put them all on our social media um you can sign up by out savvy our next one which we haven't started advertising yet is on the 5th of December um and it's going to be a little reading group about uh Luke Denona and uh Gracie May Bradley's new book um which is called Against Borders, Border Abolition. It's about border abolition. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? Um, but yes, it's great. It'll be good. And yeah, we've got more planned in the next year. But yeah, they were they were every month, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Thanks. Um, we have a question from my colleague Remy. He says uh, thanks to the panelists for really great talks. Um, his question is perhaps particularly relevant to Omi and Saskia, and it is, to what extent is non-involvement with the police important to the work of your groups and why? I would say really important. Um, you know, I think there's, I, I, I guess many people know about like the whole idea of like um, cops at Pride and should they be at Pride? And I think actually when you look at like racialized communities even more, um, many of us have experience of policing or you know police um or know of it um and I would say even from a personal standpoint I really um I have yeah quite a strong view on having um police involved in work or um yeah and we've I do think at Black Pride we've kind of like managed to pull back on police involvement and I think actually that's what um has alienated a lot of different communities that come under our umbrella from um, Pride in London um, and other Prides is that um, wider police involvement and like police on parades and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely really important um, to our work, I think. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that and say it's like absolutely fundamental to everything we do um, and you know from like the basics of organizing but yeah every year um I can't remember who it was someone described pride as a bit like Christmas now for gay people like for like radical gays that you're like oh it's come again and like I'm not talking about black pride I mean like mainstream pride they're like oh god it's come on again and like what do we do like oh it's kind of like you feel us as an obligation that like we should do something but like 
war and like yeah so like we're always <laughs> trying to come up with new and creative ways to like disrupt pride in london which i think is one of the most egregious prides out there it's like uh i think it was the original lgs miners were invited to walk at the front of the march for the 50th anniversary or something um and they said yeah if we can walk with the trade unions and pride in london were like no because their banners would obscure the barclays banner behind them like they're just like disgusting like just on every level and like i remember going this little baby 18 year old queer and seeing like the army marching it's not just the police it's like every military uh arm of the state you can imagine and like yeah the history of the police is of murdering queer people like very explicit like you know however many lesbians they get to run it like Cresta Dick is it's not a good person <laughs> um so yeah I think it's is so fundamental because yeah and like obviously it's not just queer people it's migrants as well right like the police have been involved in um yeah murdering brown and black people in this country uh for just as long as they have been involved in murdering queers um, so yeah, we do everything we can to keep away from the police. Um, but yeah, obviously there's always the fear of like being infiltrated. We don't know that it's happened, so yeah. Thanks, um, Amy and Saskia. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes of the event, so please do um, send in your questions using the Q&A function. <laughs> uh, I've got a question for you, Jason. Um, someone says, Jason, I really appreciate your intervention and its scope and scale. However, isn't one of the issues here a history of the absence of gay men's solidarity broadly with other movements over time? <laughs> so recent publications on the history of HIV point to how the kind of singular history focusing on gay men has overlooked the work struggles and deaths of trans people and lesbians. Has more recent activism included other groups who might also be affected or is it very much focused on the needs of gay men? Um, I think that depends on who you're looking at, just to be blunt about it. Um, there are definitely have been um, gay men's activist groups who have been had a pretty singular focus on gay men. Um, to be completely honest, I don't study or research them, um, particularly because um, my research has focused on Black gay activists, um, their work has very much been indebted to and in conversation with um, different strands, not only just within the broader LGBTQ movement, um, but also other movements in terms of like, you know, working class solidarity and um, in terms of women's rights and things like that as well. So one of the activists who I've um, been working with and speaking to a lot about his own work is called Alex Obolade. Um, Alex Obolade used to lead a group called the Friday Group in the late 1980s to the early 1990s. And I've looked through the kind of like activist uh, material and a lot of it was to do with um, ending attacks on lesbian couples or looking at you know discrimination which was taking place in schools or even on the poll tax riots or on you know stopping the arms trades and things like that so it i get that the question is about broadness um but it's difficult to answer that properly because you know i i don't re i don't look at those movies i don't research those movies and those kinds of exclusions because they just don't tend to have concerned where black gay men have been um if you're a black gay man you're someone who is already um not only um kind of like oppressed by you know aspects of sexuality but also race so it's impossible for a black gay man to have been involved in a kind of like queer movement without investment in outside movements as well so like respectfully that's kind of a question for white gay men i think Thank you. Um, there's a question that I can imagine um, all of you potentially answering so you can see who <laughs> would like to. Um, so another anonymous <laughs> question. Um, while the more recent queer movements are moving towards a more diverse representation of issues, how receptive have other activism, so for example, the working class movement and black rights movement, been to queer people and their issues? Have these movements made space for queer people, not only as members, but also as leaders? If not, how do we build solidarities across activisms to make stronger oppositions between fascist forces today? Can I answer that? Yeah, of course. Um, building on what I said before, um, I sometimes think that sometimes these statements come because people just don't know, I, which is fair because, you know, I didn't know these things before I like dug in and started to like look into the archives and actually start to research these things. So. 
1987, there was something called the Black Gay Men's Conference, um, which was, you know, coming together with Black Gay Men to talk about the issues affecting Black Gay Men. Um, there you had um, campaign groups um, from racial justice movements come in and talk about, you know, their struggles and also give solidarity um, with the gay community as well. So one particular example was the Tottenham Three. Um, this was a miscarriage of justice to do with the Broadwater Farm riots where a police officer died and this was like blamed on these three Black men who had nothing to do with that. Um, so there has been this presence of um, other solidarity movements um, within um, broad LGBT movements as well. Um, another example is the Gay Liberation Front. So there's a really beautiful image of the Gay Liberation Front protesting and these um, drummers from the Mangrove Cafe who went and marched uh, alongside them. And this was to do with Asian consent laws. And something people don't know, so sorry to explain, the Mangrove was a kind of um, restaurant in Notting Hill, which was the center of a lot of Black Panther activity um, in the UK. What a lot of people don't know is that the Mangrove restaurant and the Black Panthers were helping to facilitate a lot of the activity of the um, Gay Liberation Front, which included gay men and lesbians as well. So there have been a lot of these intertwined activist histories. People just don't know them. And then people will assume that, oh, this therefore must not have happened or said that, you know, because of these, you know, historical exclusions, it must be the case that this was the case everywhere. But if you do look for the archives, if you do look at the research, the evidence of solidarity and of these inspired movements is very much there. Um, in terms of like taking on positions of leadership, um, someone like Alex Obolade, he in he kind of got his start up in the um striking miners movement. Um, he wasn't a miner himself, but he was kind of a solidarity kind of protester and he got very involved in that. And he started to understand the importance of coalition building, um, came to London and started getting involved in the LGBTQ movement. But by the late 1990s to the early 2000s, he was one of the major spokespeople on police brutality in this country. So if you search him, Alex Ovalade moving to justice, he's been someone who's been a leader in a lot of these um, different groups. So he would, be the person speaking on BBC about, you know, um, police killings of heterosexual black men in Brixton and things like that. So there have been these leaders, they're just not known. And the job of people, rather than to kind of, you know, kind of finger wag and be like, well, you know, people have not been getting involved, is to actually go and look at the people who have been doing this. Um, because I think often when I've spoken to them, sometimes they've been frustrated by these discourses as well. Um, sometimes it would be very easy for me to come here and say, yeah, um, these like black protest movements have never included gay men and people would just believe that face front. Uh, but there have been these people who have been very much involved in this. There's Ted Brown, who I wrote about for The Guardian, who was involved in Lewisham action against policing for 10 years of his life. And this was helping out all sorts of young black youth and this was a leadership position as well. Um, so yeah, I always just kind of, before I always ask people when they ask me this, I'm like, have you checked, have you searched and not been able to find it? Have you looked at this person and their work? Thanks. Um, Omi and Saskia, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, I would just agree with what J Jason said, that like it's easy to imagine these groups like, OK, there are black people and there are queers and there are working class people and like they're all struggling on their own. And like, actually. Uh, it's always more complicated that like in the present and the past. And um, yeah, I think it's never you know, to go back to the example I was giving of lesbians against support the miners, you know, like they, they were all working class, like some of them were from mining families, like, you know, it wasn't just a case, like, they were supporting the miners from a place of like class solidarity, as well as, um, yeah, anything else, as well as queer solidarity and all that stuff. So yeah, if anything, I think that like, what Jason was talking about, like the queer movement needs to be better at being like, <laughs> anti-racism is just part of what we do like class politics is a part of what we do um yeah just to add on to that i think sometimes the issue we have is that sometimes we think these discourses around solidarity and intersectionality are new um sometimes we act as if like it all started with 2012 everyday sexism website and everyone was just introduced to it and actually you know people have been having these conversations for 50 years in fact the thing that I found very frustrating about this research is that I've kind of gone back to something from 1970 and be like, oh, this really looks like a conversation for 2022, because we've just been talking in circles and circles and circles. But that doesn't mean that progress hasn't been made. It just kind of means that progress is not linear. It kind of comes and goes, it comes and goes, it comes and goes, basically. Um, thank you so much uh, to both of you. We're, I think I need to wrap things up now. Um, unfortunately, I had like 
20 more questions written down that I wanted to ask you guys. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I feel really um, grateful to have been able to chair this um, and grateful to all three of you for your presentations and everything you've raised. And um, I really hope that we'll be able to continue this conversation in some way. Um, but also we have um, tomorrow night's event and then another um, event on Thursday evening. Uh, to look forward to um, as part of the Stuart Hall Foundation and Code Conference. Um, so tomorrow's event will be looking at housing and then the event on Thursday at healthcare. Um, and I think the Stuart Hall Foundation has just posted a link to that in the in the chat for anyone who'd like to come and they'll both be starting at 5 p.m. Um, <laughs> you can also follow the Stuart Hall Foundation and Code on social media and keep up with um, our work more generally. Um, but for now, all that's left is, left is to um, firstly uh, thank our panelists so much. Thank you, Omi, Jason and Saskia. Um, and thank you so much to all of you at home for joining us and for your questions. And um, I'll look forward to reconnecting again soon. Thanks so much, Ruth, for hosting.